Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, The Tall Grass Prairie of Missouri Above and Below the Soil Surface with Scott Lord. My name is Haley Howard and I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us today and thank our Grow Native sponsors for 2023. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please only put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, Executive Director Carol David will read those out to Sam. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on Sam. Sam Lord is an instructor and PhD candidate at the University of Missouri. He is responsible for teaching three courses in soil science and ecology. Sam's research is focused on soil ecology and the physical, chemical, and biological processes in the soil that lead to emergent ecosystems. Sam is a former ecologist with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, where he focused on the management restoration and research of no Northern Missouri State Parks. We are excited to have Sam here today to share his research and experience with us. And now I'll hand it over to Sam. Thank you, Haley. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a beautiful day outside. So thank you for coming and uh, spending time with, with us this afternoon. Um, as was already mentioned, I don't normally get an introduction to these kind of things, but um, we're going to talk about the tall grass prairie Missouri above and below ground and, and what I mean by that is the ecology of a prairie um, from a floristic standpoint and from a soil standpoint and how they connect to each other. So first and foremost, these are just some of the fields of study that I do look at in my PhD. Um, I do want to give some credit where it's due. Uh, I came back to graduate school with a foundational knowledge of prairies and soil. And that's that's due to some, some people that helped me along the way. And some of those individuals are people like Ken McCarty and his team of ecologists at DNR. Their unique perspective on, on restoration and management of prairies has helped me and allowed me to expand on some of this, these topics. Of course, Bruce Schutte, who is part of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, uh, we've spent I don't even know how many hours on the phone talking about the finer points of prairie restoration and and uh, how to manage prairie ecosystems. And of course, Justin Thomas, who had the tall task of trying to teach me uh, plant morphology, which is going to be um, part of this topic today as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. We're going to talk about uh, some introductory material first that gets us all in the same playing field. And, and we're going to start off with the definition of what is prairie. If you were to ask an entomologist, a biologist, a botanist, a soil scientist, you're going to get multiple different um, definitions depending on the person. And they probably wouldn't agree on one single definition. But what I can say is that we would probably all come to the conclusion that Merriam-Webster is lacking in their definition of a prairie. Land in or predominantly in grass is not, uh, does not hold weight in, in those of us that have interacted with prairies and spent time in prairies. So uh, for the context of, of this research, I came up with my own definition. So it's important to remember that we're going to, as we progress through the webinar, we are going to use this definition uh, to describe prairies. And that's an emergent ecosystem derived from soil forming factors and dominated by climate and C4 grasses in which diverse compositions of herbaceous primary producers sustain higher order biota. And as you can see from these pictures of 25 mile prairie and cook meadow these there's a lot more than just grasses going on here right so what have we done um a lot of you have probably seen this image multiple times i know uh, a lot of missouri prairie foundation webinars use um, this gis layer to convey what has happened to our prairies well in the yellow on the right here is the official land office um, the General Land Office Survey from 1852. And this was compiled by Walter Schrader in 1982. Um, but all of the yellow in this picture is the historic prairie that's likely undermapped um, 
in the state. And now we have lost over 99% of that yellow um, layer, the, the prairie here in the state of Missouri. So when we change land use, what we do is alter vegetation and ecosystem function. And some of those things include things like carbon dynamics, which I will bring up at the towards the end when I get into some of the results of, of this research. Ecosystem services are heavily altered. Plant and animal diversity, that may be quite obvious when we change land use. Um, and of course, water quality as well. So the, these systems, I'm, I'm going to try to convince people, even though you probably don't need convincing, that there are other means that we need to conserve these ecosystems and how important they are beyond even just these, um, these details. So why the prairie soil? Well, my, my students would probably get really tired of me saying this, um, but soil is the fundamental medium for all terrestrial ecosystems. The prairie soil specifically is home to some of the most complex processes um, across any ecosystem. And that's shown um, in the biodiversity of the soil, also shown above ground as the emergent ecosystem when plant soil feedback is in equilibrium between those two states. Right. So a good example of this um, would be this plant that a lot of you may know that's shown on the screen, Baptisia australis, otherwise known as uh, blue wild indigo or wild blue indigo. Um, it's a legume, but that that word holds some weight and, and it's often misunderstood. Some some may think the plant itself is actually fixing atmospheric nitrogen, which is what legumes are able to do, but it's not the plant. The plant cannot fix nitrogen at all. That plant is in a symbiotic relationship with a soil microbial community, and that microbial community is, is the entity fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere, breaking that triple bond of N2, molecular N2, to make it plant available and, and to make growth occur within these within these leguminous plants. So that is just one aspect of, of the plant soil feedback that we can really delve into here, but there's many more. And the reason why I'm looking at the prairie soil is in some cases, it is the peak condition of efficiency and sustainability across plant soil feedback and the interactions between soil and plants. And my my stance is, is really looking at prairies as holding information that we humans need to become more sustainable and more efficient so we can progress um, in, in how we treat ecosystems, not only just native ecosystems, but agro ecosystems, for instance. So these are gonna be very important. And when we look at ecology um, as a whole, we tend to miss soil. You may have seen a, a picture like this in, in high school ecology or even grade school ecology. And this is the energy period, often pyramid, excuse me, um, or it's called the, the trophic triangle or trophic pyramid. And to me, there's quite obviously something missing and it's the soil. So for this webinar, I'm going to ask you to kind of throw this specific um, model out the window. And it can be just for the next 40 minutes if you want. You can take back this, this model if you want of, of ecology and, and energy transfer. But I'm gonna try to propose a new way of looking at things that's going to include the soil. So let's take a soil profile. We can imagine that this is an MPF prairie, although an MPF prairie would be much more diverse than what you see here. Um, but the soil profile does look slightly similar to some of our Southwest Missouri um, prairies. So I want you to think not in, in, in terms of one ecological model, one triangle, but really two. The first ecological pyramid or ecological um, interactions occur below the soil. And if we start here on the left, you can see that I'm looking at microbial communities, viruses, um, genetic material is being carried by multiple entities in the system. And if we were to take one handful of healthy soil, billions and billions of interactions are occurring, not only between microbes themselves, 
but specifically between plants above ground and the microbes in the soil. So in this ecosystem, I want you to imagine the plants are part of this ecosystem, a part of the below ground ecosystem in which they're reaching into another ecosystem in which we typically interact. But below the soil surface, the important things like nutrient cycling, gross primary productivity, which is all biomass that is, um, that is uh, made by photosynthetic organisms, um, including respiration or CO2 production as well. That's the gross primary production. But there's also things going on in the soil like symbionts or symbiosis, where these, these um, microfauna and microflora are interacting with plants to increase plant fitness. They have pest resistance, biotic resistance, fungal resistance, all sorts of things. And they also add to the overall resilience of the ecosystem itself. So when we take that ecosystem, and you can move across here and look at nematodes in the middle and uh, soil arthropods and annelids like the uh, earthworm worm here, and they have their own ecosystem going on. And all of that kind of combines to form um, the plant community above ground, right? The ecosystem above ground. And that's what we typically interact with. And that, that trophic triangle that, we, that I showed you previous to this, that energy transfer is all based on the energy that is made and conserved in the soil and the plants. So regardless of where you start in this above ground ecosystem, you can start with the little house on the prairie. You will eventually work your way back to the interactions of the soil and the plants, right? So that's kind of how I want you to think of this moving forward is two ecosystems. One that is providing the foundational structure for all ecosystems above it. Right? And so the way this research is kind of framed is that we're gonna try to create a chrono sequence here. We're gonna take an arrow and this arrow represents the expected progression of floristic quality and soil health indicators. Um, across different land use types. So on the extremes of this arrow, we'll take the bottom um, extreme first the, in the red here, is I use the analogy of a parking lot. This soil does not resemble anything of its native system. It is not interacting on any level the same way um, in which it was formed. So you have lost all physical, chemical, and biological processes um, that were inherent once inherent in that soil. And on the opposite end of this of this arrow of quality, if you will, or standards, is remnant prairie and the undisturbed, unplowed soil that exists within them. And once again, I want you to think of these as information systems in which we can, we don't know a lot about these interactions. And, and there's a lot to learn. But in order to fill in this chrono sequence, we're going to go ahead and and use standards of degraded soil that would be you know active agriculture or conventional methods of agriculture shown here um, in a soybean field that is missing an entire row due to erosion um, and and then if you take a step up from that we start to try to restore what we see above ground and luckily for us what we see above ground tends to interact completely uh, with what's below but we'll take that as soil under perennial restoration practices as the next step up in this, in this um, floristic quality and soil health indicators. So this is the chrono sequence we're shooting for. But we are going to work backwards. Most of these soils and most of this data is of remnant prairies. Um, and I'll go through the methodology of how we did that. But once again, think of prairies and the reason why we need to conserve and preserve and manage these systems it's because they harbor information that can enrich our lives and, and progress us forward if we could just simply take the time to understand what's going on. And there's a lot to unpack there, which I don't know everything, of course, but um, we are trying, me and my collaborators are trying to um, open up that black box of the soil. So how are we going about determining plant soil feedback? And this is basically the methodology of how we're doing this in this research. First and foremost, this, this is a map of all the sites that we, we sampled. There's 37 sites um, across Missouri 
in which you'll notice that the red are restored or active sites or reconstructions, which I will tell you the difference between all of those um, coming up momentarily. And then in Southwest Missouri, we have our largest uh, tracks of remnant prairie left. So how we went about doing this is I determined 10 point transects at each of these sites. So I collected 10 samples at each one, starting from the top of the hill and moving down slope. And for those of you who have been to some of these prairies, you'll know that that topography is not very steep. So we chose the highest point we could find and move downhill so we can account for um, soils that interact with slope. And then we collected floristic data and soil samples. So we have 370 soil samples um, paired with floristic data, right? And so an example of a floristic plot, and, and we're going to compare these momentarily between restorations and, and remnants. Um, we take a quarter meter quadrat, as you can see in this picture here. I believe this is in Linden Prairie, but I, I, I'm failing to remember where I took the picture, but I believe it's in Linden Prairie. Um, what we do is, is take all species within that quadrat. We account for all of them, give them a coverage value. Um, and then once I'm done doing that, I pull the soil sample from inside that quadrat. And that increases the likelihood of root interactions within that within the core that I've pulled. And I do want to thank also Andrew Braun helped me with a lot of these. And uh, as you go through floristic data, you may notice that there's little spikes in, in the amounts of, uh, of data that are accounted for. And that's, that's mostly because Andrew was helping. So, um, but that's how we go about getting a floristic plot. So if we take that and we compare two different sites, an example of a restoration here, I'm going to use Mark Twain State Park um, and the prairie restoration that was occurring here as the first example. And I'm very proud of this site because I, I spent a lot of time looking at it and, and, and interacting with it and, and trying to restore different aspects of it. And a lot of people may look at this picture of Mark Twain State Park and look, look at that beautiful prairie. But once again, if we if we go back to my definition of prairies and those of us have who have walked through remnants, notice that this looks different. There's dominant species uh, occurring with a lack of biodiversity within this system. So if we were to if you can remember what that quadrat looks like, it's a 20 by 20 quadrat in a quarter meter. This would be a representative um, quadrat here. First thing I want I want to point everybody's attention to is the length of this table. That is the species richness. And this is a typical um, quadrat that would be at Mark Twain State Park. But I've also highlighted the C value, which is in red, right? And that doesn't mean carbon. That stands for coefficient of conservatism. And quickly, for those of you that do not know what the coefficient of conservatism is, Every plant in Missouri on the order of 3,000 species are given a rank of 0 to 10. And this was done by Justin Thomas and Doug Ladd um, a while ago. I think it was 2015. Um, and it is given a rank. So invasive species are automatically given a 0, or exotic species, non-native species, are given a 0. Those plants that have a 0 to 3 ranking tend to be the weedier species or the more generalist species. You can find them growing up in parking lots and cracks on sidewalks, or um, you can find them in restorations, things like that. If you have a if if a plant has a value from four to six, that's typically the matrix species. That that those species make up um, kind of the background noise of intact systems and somewhat disturbed systems. And then the ranking of seven to ten are your most highly conservative species that tend to require an intact soil profile or a lack of disturbance. And I don't mean disturbance like fire. I mean, um, uh, you know, synthetic disturbances like machinery moving across it and things like that. Um, that when you have seven to 10 as a ranking, you know you're in a high quality system. Those species should exist in high quality systems. So as we progress through this and we, and we compare this to the uh, remnant prairie that's coming up momentarily, I want you to pay attention to the length, which is the richness, and also the C values, right, um, and how high they can go. And, I, and one caveat here, 
I do want to point out that some of these C values um, do not hold some weight when you're in a complete reconstruction of a prairie where you're going from something like row crop agriculture to completely reconstructing a site because seed sources are brought in. They're typically cultivated in a seed drill or something like that. And certain species, even with a high C value, act differently in those sites. So in this restoration of Mark Twain State Park, these species that you see on the screen were still there. They were within the seed bank. They were not seeded in, at least, at least they, you know, Bruce Schutte could probably talk a little bit to some of these, but most of these are not seeded in in some reconstructive way. So that's why these are comparable between a remnant and a, and a restored site. So let's let's go to a remnant site and look at Woods Prairie. And right off the bat, the image that you see here is very different from the image I just showed you of a restoration. You saw an ocean of liatris um, or blazing star in the in the picture at Mark Twain. Here you can point out and look and see the biodiversity on the landscape. In my definition, I talked about C4 grasses. That also includes C3 grasses, but I didn't put both. Um, you can see these grasses are dominating this landscape. You can see Sporobolus with its hair, hair-like morphology um, or horsetail morphology. And you can see different composites in the, in the foreground and, and things like that. The, the biodiversity is just there. So when I pull up a quadrat from this site, not only do you notice the length is much longer, right? Th there's much more richness to these quadrats, more species in a quadrat as a whole. But as I point you back to the coefficients of conservatism, you also notice there are much higher rankings here. But one thing also to point out is that these rankings span the entire zero to 10 scale. And that's typical of remnant prairies. You may not have the non-native species here at the bottom, like tall fescue um, and red top, but you typically have ones to nines in, in a remnant prairie. And that's, um, that's what we're getting at here. But this is a typical quadrat in a remnant site. And what are the mechanisms in the soil that prevent restorations from looking like this? And I, you know, a lot of restorations, and I've never seen one, actually reach remnant status or what I would consider um, the functionality or even the feel of a remnant prairie. So really a lot of this research is, is looking at what is the mechanism that's been lost in the land use, the prior land use. Right? So as far as soil methods go, and I'm not gonna go through each one of these, don't worry, but I did want to show that we are looking at the physical, chemical and biological properties of these soils. And we are doing multiple analyses um, uh, across each sample that give us valuable insight into what is going on in the snapshot of that soil at that time. And that's where that floristic data comes in as, as supplemental information. Um, we can see what those roots are interacting with. Things like um, the macro and micronutrients or the carbon that is stored there um, or the active carbon that is microbially mediated um, or the biological substrates that go on here. And as we, uh, move on in the presentation, I'll, I'll bring up some results that are, uh, that show some of these methods. So look inside the soil ecosystem. This is where we're getting into the data that, that comes out of this. And I'm really going to focus, instead of throwing a ton of graphs and trying to fit an entire um, uh, amount of analysis into one PowerPoint, I, I'm just going to pick a few. We're going to talk about the relationship of carbon and nitrogen and then some interactions between the microbial communities as well. So first, this graph, and I'm sorry, you have to look at a scatter plot here, uh, but this is a graph stating how highly correlated carbon and nitrogen are. And the different points on this graph, the different colors that you see here, are all different land uses. So you can see there's active agriculture on here, there's a remnant, there's remnant prairies on here, reconstructions, restorations. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter the land use. Carbon and nitrogen are fundamentally linked in the soil. And not only in the soil, but we see these same ratios start to appear within the human body or animal bodies or microbial bodies. So 
these are fundamental um, interactions between two elements that are very important in the soil. And um, carbon is kind of like the uh, the economic trade that goes on in the soil between plants in the soil. So carbon has the ability to hold on to nitrogen. So you increase carbon, you have the ability to pool nitrogen in a system. And that's that's once again a fundamental element uh, or, or relationship between these two um, elements. So I want to... Uh, Kind of set the stage here by by taking along that chrono sequence that I showed earlier. Let's look at a remnant prairie. In this case, this is 25 mile prairie and an active agricultural site. And I'm going to try to show you between soil organic carbon and the total nitrogen of these two sites, just how drastic these comparisons are and just how we may be able to unlock secrets hidden in, in these highly efficient systems that are prairies to help us improve our understanding of how to feed people in, in the future. So first and foremost, I know these are a lot of numbers and I apologize for that, but these bars are relative to each other. So the green and yellow bars. In the green, you're looking at uh, the percent of soil organic carbon. In the yellow, you're looking at the percentage of total nitrogen in each sample of soil. The black line delineates the two sites. Below that black line is the active agricultural site that has been fully fertilized for over 60 years. It's in typical uh, corn soybean rotation. Above that is 25 Mile Prairie, uh, one of the better, um, the higher performers, I guess you should you could say, as as far as soil health goes, um, on this spectrum. And, and so when we look at these, you can, it, just the bars themselves, it's quite obvious just staring at it, that there's a great reduction between the two sites, between a system that is under perennial vegetation and storing carbon for thousands of years. And, and the ability of nitrogen to come into that system pool, be essentially unavailable to plants unless they form a symbiotic relationship in the soil to go get it. And then comparing that to a, a uh, simplified system, a system where we put a monoculture on it. We disturb the soil. We do not allow for surpluses of carbon to enter that soil or become stored in the profile. And therefore, nitrogen is not, is not going to be stored at either, right? And, and so some, some of the results of this become pretty striking to me. And if you look at the difference between the prairie soil and the agricultural site, we see that there's almost a 70% loss of soil organic carbon. And I'm not saying organic matter, I'm saying organic carbon. Um, organic carbon makes up organic matter, but it is not the totality of it. But if you put this on the field scale and you go field for field, and then you realize how much prairie we've lost and converted to agriculture, on the order of 50 to 70%, of total soil organic carbon has been lost and it goes up to the atmosphere. It does not come back down and it is not stored unless we, we preserve some sort of perennial system uh, to be able to store that carbon back into the soil. Once again, that symbiotic relationship between plants and the soil itself. Maybe even a bigger um, surprise to some people, maybe not soil scientists, but to some people um, is there's a 60% 60, 60 loss of nitrogen from a system that is under perennial vegetation or has never been plowed to a plowed system. In agriculture, we are, this is constantly one of the biggest inputs of synthetic fertilizer that we need is nitrogen. Yet in the case of the prairie, the prairie knows how to get it, they know how to store it, and they know how to not lose it. Um, they don't lose it readily. And the system on the left, the active agricultural system is very prone to drought. It's very prone to, pe prone to pests, things like that. On the right, the, the perennial system is not prone to either one of those, even if it is a drought situation outside. I don't think most of us have not driven by a prairie during a drought and been like, look at how dead and dying that prairie is during this drought. It's still green. It's still flowering. It's still making viable fruit. 
So there are answers within the soil profile that can help us along the way, right? And a 70% loss of soil organic carbon has occurred across the state or 50 to 70%, depending on the comparison. And that's gone to the atmosphere and it's not coming back, right? Or not that it's not coming back, but it won't come back just naturally unless we change some of our ways, right? And we have the ability to store nitrogen, but some of the secrets may be held in the soil of the prairie. So I take the same image and we're gonna compare the microbial communities between these two sites now. And forgive me, there is going to be, uh, I am gonna to have to explain things in some possibly heavy terminology, but I'll do my best to simplify it um, the best I can. First though, I want, I want to give you a visual comparison of two soils. Now, um, the soil on the left is the soil from this ag site. The soil on the right is actually a soil from a restoration. Um, it's actually from uh, Long Branch State Park as a restoration, which has been going for 30 something years under perennial vegetation. But these two soils are very similar to each other. The difference is the mechanism of destruction that's occurred. So that, that being under perennial restoration, you can imagine what the soil of 25 mile prairie looks like if I had a picture comparing the two, which I don't, but I can tell you that the color is deeper, uh, the aggregates are more obvious, and it's obvious that there is a lot of organic matter going on in that soil as well. So let's look at the microbial community breakdown here. And once again, above the red line is 25 mile prairie. Below the, the red line is the active agricultural site. Once again, these bars are relative to each other. It's, it's no secret, but I do need to um, add some uh, context to this. So what we're doing here is doing a phospholipid fatty acid analysis. And that's a long, um, it's a long word or a group of words basically describing the skin of microbes. The outer membrane of microbes is made up of different phospholipids and, and where those phosphate groups fit in that lipid bilayer is, is how we determine these. So as I go across the top, I'm just going to explain briefly what they are. Um, AM fungi, may, some of you may already know, is arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, and, and important in many ways. And they are nutrient transporters. They are resource allocators. They have high infection rates in, in remnant prairie, and they can move resources around within a prairie. They can gather resources for specific plant species. Um, they're, they're kind of a jack of all trades in, in the soil profile. Uh, moving just beyond that, just to where, where it says fungi, those are biomarkers that fit saprophytic fungi. And by saprophytic fungi, their main role is simply breaking down carbon-based uh, materials, right? Um, if you've ever turned over a log in the woods and you've seen uh, fungal hyphae or mycelium in, in a web-like structure, those tend to be saprophytic fungi, right? And then as we move along, gram-negative bacteria. These are bacterial biomarkers. And what makes them gram negative is that on the skin of these microbes, and you can also lump this into gram positive as a comparison, the skin of this microbe, of these microbes, have a layer called a peptidoglycan layer. And that layer is either exposed, as in the gram negative bacteria, or excuse me, the gram positive bacteria, or it is between an interlayer in the gram negative bacteria. And the determination between those two things is we can put a stain or a dye um, on these bacteria and the gram positive will actually incorporate that stain. And you can see it, you can see that microbe being stained. The gram negative will not allow that stain to come in contact with that peptidoglycan layer. So that is the difference between those two. Um, and by the way, these are not getting down to the species level. These are really functional groups or composition of, of soil microbial communities. As we go past the gram positive bacteria, you get to actinobacteria, which are a form of gram positive bacteria. But actinobacteria were thought for the longest time to be uh, fungal mycelium. Uh, but really they just share a morphology characteristic with, with mycelium and they form hyphal networks, but they're really just chains of, of gram-positive bacteria. 
and they are kind of the, the superstars of breaking down complex carbon structures. And they're very good at it. And some of them can even um, fix nitrogen. The Frankia genus of actinobacteria can form symbiotic relationships with certain plants and they can fix nitrogen. And then eukaryotes on the far right are um, essentially organisms, single celled organisms or multicellular organisms that tend to have membrane bound organelles within their cells, right? We are eukaryotes. We are multicellular organisms, but we also have mitochondria and, and rhizobia in our, um, or ribosomes, excuse me, in our, in our cells that are membrane bound. And that, that's the difference between a eukaryote and a bacterial or a, or a fungal cell, right? So when we look at this data, you can see across the board, it doesn't matter what group you look at, there is a great reduction in every category between these sites. And the microbial community is often referred to as the eye of the needle in which all organic matter must pass. And really what that statement is saying is organic matter is the pool of nutrients for all plants. And the only way those nutrients become available for plants is through the gut of a microorganism. And it's all of these microbes working in tandem, working together to form a relatively, um, it's not a closed system, but a tight cycle in the prairie ecosystem that allows for nutrient cycling to occur in a constant rate or a relatively constant rate. And they perform many other functions in the soil. But when we take away, uh, as I said, the eye of the needle and we reduce it by such great amounts, you can imagine that we have to um, amend our soils in order for plant growth to occur. And this is one of the big reasons why we need so much synthetic fertilizer on our agricultural systems. We've simplified them and we have um, heavily degraded the microbial communities that that exist on them in conventional methods of agriculture. So on the previous slide, I, I noted that uh, about 68% or 70% of soil organic carbon was depleted. Well, for the bacteria, or excuse me, the microbial community here, this composition, it you have a 72% reduction in, in the biological factor of the soil. And that is analogous in some ways to, if you can imagine, your favorite spot out in nature, and you think of that ecosystem, uh, remove 72% of all the biomass in that ecosystem. Does it look the same? Does it function the same? Um, can it be restored you know, to its previous level? Likely not, which also means we, we should be preserving these remnant prairies uh, and, and hold on to them very tightly for a lot of reasons like this. Once again, information is stored here that we don't yet understand, okay? Another way of looking at this data is just this, this bar graph of, of different treatments and, and you're looking at row crop reconstructions, older restorations and, and remnant sites um, on this graph on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is that total PLFA, all of those biomarkers put together that were on the previous slide and then averaged out across the treatments. And um, you can see there are significant differences between remnant prairies, older restorations and reconstructions, and certainly row crop. Um, one, one thing that you do need to know about this, that, that these do fluctuate on a temporal scale or on a, you know, a temporal and spatial scale. So in a lot of cases, if you were to sample a little bit later in the summer or even early, early fall, these numbers would increase quite a bit, um, especially in the remnants. Now, where they don't increase very often are the newer restorations in the row crop side, because you're not, you don't have a whole lot of biomass entering back into the system. So there is a difference there, and these these can fluctuate. But this is just one snapshot in time, looking at this. And another way, I, I, I do want to add this: um, that this is a measure of biomass. It is not a measure of function of these microbes. So when, when you see, and it's great that we are, we are getting biomass back into the soil, especially microbial biomass, back into the soil. We can cycle nutrients and perform functions and, and things like that. But as these systems recover, an increase in microbial biomass does not 
reflect an increase in microbial function. And you can take this slide back to the to the floristic quality slide between my comparison between restorations um, and remnants and note that a lot of the, the plants um, in a remnant that don't return to a restoration is likely because of this. That function does not return, but we do see an increase in biomass and that's likely because we're returning carbon and nitrogen back to the soil. So once again, there's a lot to unlock here in these soils. And um, we can learn a lot from these systems in order to become more efficient and more sustainable and return the eye of the needle back to the soil. And then as we, you know, we're coming to the end of this, this webinar, there is room for more research. My collaborators and, and myself are not um, satisfied with looking at microbial communities from such a high level. Um, we, what we wanna do is sequence the genome of the soil profile. And that involves looking, that kind of data would get us to phylum level microbial diversity, instead of just looking at the skins of microbes and putting them into compositional groups, we can get an understanding of true microbial diversity, or at least closer to a true estimate of uh, microbial diversity, and then give us very valuable insights across land, land use into the symbiotic relationships um, within the plant soil feedback. And things like nitrogen fixation, denitrification, growth, stimulation, competitive insight, and resource allocation. If we can compare these agroecosystems and see what we've lost as compared to an analogous um, or, or a previous natural community that was once there and see what was lost, maybe we can shoot uh, to regain that function and not just increase microbial biomass. So with that, I do want to thank MPF for not only having me here, but allowing me to sample all of these prairies. It was a significant portion of prairies that I sampled that were Missouri Prairie Foundation prairies. And I, I want to leave this portion of the talk with um, a quote from E.O. Wilson that I think sums up Missouri Prairie Foundation perfectly. Um, and Edward O. Wilson, for those of you that don't know, um, was kind of one of the godfathers of, of modern uh, ecology. And he was also quoted as saying, if I could go back, I would be a microbial ecologist. So interestingly enough, we were talking about that. But I will argue that every scrap of biological diversity is priceless, to be learned and cherished and never to be surrender, surrendered without a struggle. Once again, I think that highlights um, kind of the mission of, of Missouri Prairie Foundation, and hopefully this, this research as a whole as well. And uh, also, I want to thank my committee, my PhD committee, and some of the funding strings that go along with that. I do have some extremely uh, helpful scientists, some brilliant people working on my committee and it. They, they do allow me to be uh, creative with this, with this project. And uh, quite honestly, they rarely say no to even things that I think are kind of crazy. So <laughs> um, they're, they're great to work with. They're fantastic scientists and they're extremely helpful in guiding me throughout this entire process. And I also want to give uh, a thank you to the Agricultural Research res, uh, Research Service Lab that I do most of the sampling in. Um, Jill Staples is, is very helpful and, and her team to, to analyze my samples when I can't be there when I'm teaching and things like that. And of course, all the agencies that are involved in this entire process as well, from the University of Missouri all the way to the Ozark Regional Land Trust. So I appreciate um, your time this afternoon, and I, I hope at some point you can get outside and um, enjoy the, the sunny weather. Sam, that was fantastic. You um, not only uh, have so much expertise in this complex topic, but you are gifted at explaining it. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we do have a number of questions. And um, also, I, I want to remind everyone that, as Haley said at the beginning, this webinar is recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel so that you can revisit it, which I will do as well, because, um, as Sam said, there's so much to unpack that I um, will need a refresher. <laughs> but let me um, get into some of the questions here. Um, 
Margie in Kansas, and this question I think uh, pertains to near the beginning of your presentation, Sam. She says, how is it that, or or perhaps it, it, it didn't, but she, she says, how is it that burning causes a quote, flush of resources for perennial prairie plants? I just read an article that found that burning causes a burst of growth for Echinacea angustifolia, that's a, a species of coneflower in Kansas, and uh, a species of blazing star. And one hypothesis is the quote, flush of resources. What is meant by that? So uh, first of all, I do wanna say that um, I, I'm not necessarily an expert on, on the pyrogenic aspect of, of nutrients putting uh, going back into the soil, but I do know something. So I, I will try to answer the best I can. Uh, one thing that, that does happen when we burn is that we volatilize a lot of gases from the biomass that that is being burnt, right? Um, those plants that are burning, a lot of gas is being given off, but a lot of elements, uh, nutrients, as you uh, we may be able to put it, um, do not volatilize into a gas. And things like potassium and phosphorus, phosphorus being a big one there, uh, do return to the soil profile, at least at the surface. And so uh, I don't know about that echinacea species exactly and how it interacts. But when you have a flush of available nutrients in the soil profile that are not locked up in some sort of system, you can have, especially um, some of our more generalist species, take quick advantage of that resource flush uh, where it's not required of a symbiotic relationship in the soil, at least for that flash in the pan before those resources get reincorporated back into biomass. So it's not surprising. And it's also when we burn um, our prairies, the next year when we go back and look at the floristic surveys, you often see an increase in species that, that you wouldn't see on another given year because some of that is thatch removal, uh, available sunlight, but it's also um, the opening up of those, those niches that aren't there unless those resources are are available that are not taken up or or immobilized in the soil. Thank you. Um, Aaron asks or says super interesting work. Does your comparison of prairie soil uh, soil organic carbon per the percent of soil organic carbon and the percent of nitrogen refer to a comparison with a conventional agricultural soil? And could you comment on how these comparisons between prairie and agricultural soils might change if we considered a soil under an organic agricultural production and or a no-till system? Yeah, so um, I don't um, have anything from a no-till system, but I can I can speak from some of the literature that you may read and, and things like that. Uh, but a comparison, the comparison between, in my research, I actually have multiple comparisons going on between reconstructions, once again, that are coming out of some sort of row crop agriculture in most instances, um, restorations, and remnant prairies. So those carbon and nitrogen ratios are often higher in remnant systems. So you have more carbon per unit nitrogen, and it's immobilizing that nitrogen. It's able to keep more into the soil. But as you go down that land use ladder, back towards an active or conventional method of agriculture, that ratio gets to 10 to one, and it's a steady progression backwards um, in some cases, looking at that. And, and likely that's because, um, or you can look at it the other way from active agriculture back to remnant, when that ratio starts going up, it's because we were able to put carbon back into the soil in a perennial system relatively quickly, and I'm not talking about one year, two years, I'm talking about on soil time scales, you know, sometimes decades and, and even centuries. But what is not catching up in a lot of these systems is the nitrogen pool. We can put the carbon back in, but it takes a little time for that nitrogen to pick back up and, and bring that ratio back down, right? So in a lot of these restorations, they actually exceed the carbon to nit nitrogen ratio of a remnant, but it's not because it has more carbon or more nitrogen. It's because that carbon is increasing without a, a direct increase in nitrogen. Now, when it comes to 
an organic system. It depends on the organic system, number one. Uh, organic systems often rely on tillage still. We need to remember that um, because weed suppression is very hard to do in organic systems because you're not allowed to use a lot of different pesticides. Uh, so tillage often occurs a lot. And, and when we disturb that soil profile enough, a lot of inputs that great things that we're doing in organic agriculture of covering the soil constantly and having perennial vegetation can often be offset by that turnover. Um, maybe not completely, but it does put a big dent into um, you know, some of those carbon and nitrogen dynamics, but often not as big of a dent as constant tillage, right? I hope that answers the question. I think I remember all the all the details of it, but very I good. Very good. Thank you. Um, Jack uh, asks, is there a shorthand metric similar to the C rating for plants for soils to more easily compare sites? No, but that is trying to be that uh, some of some of the people that are on my committee are actually trying to do that for agricultural soils, uh, make an index that gives you a soil health score, a soil health index. So if you can get um, the analyses done within that index, it will spit out a score and you can compare values. Now that is very difficult to do. And, and I do want to say that, uh, as I've mentioned, soils are very complex and they're different from inch to inch, meter to meter, you know, mile to mile. So when you take that into account, it is very difficult to make an index. And I do not envy those individuals who are trying to make that index. That is some heavy math. That is some heavy statistics and accounting for a lot of variability in a system. But um, that is being worked on, it, but you can compare analyses directly at this point, and that, that'll give a pretty good indicator of what is going on in those soils. Thank you. And Jack has a follow-up question, and also Susan has a similar one. Um, if native prairies have the healthiest soil microbiota, can you use these soils to inject into prairie restorations or reconstructions to speed up the revival of these uh, reconstructed ecosystems? And Susan asked similarly, can they be seeded in, watered, or sprayed in? Can a soil sample from an intact prairie be increased in a lab and then put on a restoration or reconstruction plot? Those are all very interesting questions and very good questions. Uh, I. Uh, once again, I am not an expert at those kind of things, but as um, I, I will cite some people here, Dr. Alice Tipton did some work on this. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Middleton did some work on this kind of stuff. I can't, I cannot spout off their their um, uh, their results, but one thing I can say is, is you know, um, when it comes to microbial communities in, in an intact system, in an intact remnant prairie, the moment you remove that from that species or that phylum from the soil profile, you are likely cutting off ties to layers of interactions, not just one or two, but layers of interactions. They can be interacting on a fungal level, on a bacterial level, and a plant level all at the same time. And resource partitioning could be occurring. And that's what makes it so difficult. And isolating one species of, let's say, uh, an arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which a lot of people are interested in inoculating, um, finding the needle in a haystack of that one strain that can be not only cultured, but um, mass produced and have the general impact across a landscape is very, very difficult to do. And once again, I don't want to speak for those scientists that did that kind of work, uh, but I, I, I do want to say that number one, it's difficult. Number two, I think there's mixed um, results that, that happen there, and it ends up becoming species specific. The symbioses between maybe the plant and that specific um, microbial community is, like I said, specific and it's not general. So that's what makes it very hard and complex. Thank you, Sam. And I, I would just like to add, um, you know, as interest in Michael Reisel fungi and relationships to plants, as this becomes more 
uh, popular, um, there are more commercial products available to purchase. Just be aware that, uh, just be a, be aware of of the origins of these products because um, just want to check the veracity and you know uh, make sure that you're you know actually getting a sound product. Um, and we do have a, an article from Dr. Tipton on mycorrhizal fungi that we'll um, include in the email that goes out to folks tomorrow. I wanted to just add, and this relates to a couple of questions that are, are in the Q&A from Kara. Um, some people have suggested, well, can't we take plugs of soil from, from remnant prairies and, and move them? And we, we would wanna be very cautious about that because as, as Sam has illustrated, you know, one, remnants are very rare and the soil is very precious. Um, Kara did ask what percent of prairies left in Missouri, and Sam, I, I think I could address that quickly. We had 15 million acres of, of prairie up until the time of statehood in 1821, and today um, we have about 45,000 scattered acres left. So, um, and, and Sam did mention the percent early on, but but that there that's the amount in acreage. And the reason um, Kara had another question: Why are prairie remnants concentrated in Southwest Missouri? And that's uh, because the the soil is rockier, unglaciated, harder to plow. So those rocks kind of saved it from the plow. Whereas uh, in the glaciated soils of northern Missouri, just it was easier easier to plow. Um, uh, so those are all great questions. Um, and then there's another question here from Brenda um, about, I think she's referring to the chart of the microbial biomarkers. She says, all the phospholipid microbial samples of two prairies versus the agricultural field, what was so, un un so unique or special about sample 171 that it had the maximal amounts of every organism sampled? Yeah, so that that tends to be an interesting um, uh, process. And and one thing I did not mention is that carbon. Uh, well, I did kind of mention carbon to nitrogen ratios are are kind of an economic uh, system in the soil. And so if you go back and you look at that sample, and then you also look at the carbon and nitrogen ratios, you also see that those are elevated as well. And it's likely because the substrate in which these microbial um, entities are, are taking advantage of is just more available. There is more of it there. Um, so if you look at sample 171 uh, in the carbon and nitrogen, there's more of that. And as you go through here, you also see that there is an increase in microbial communities. And that, that often has to do with what microbes eat, what they decompose, uh, the enzymes that attack those um, substrates, those kind of things. And it, basically an increase of carbon and nitrogen means simply an increase or the ability to increase microbial biomass. Thank you. Um, there's a couple questions here about kind of comparing soil profiles. Uh, one, is there a similar microbial profile between prairies? And then there was another question about how does prairie soil compare to other ecosystem soils such as forest soils? Yeah, so um, how do prairie soils compare to each other and are they similar? Uh, that, number one, that's a good question. I can tell you from a from a PLFA standpoint, they are all different. <laughs> they are all very unique in their compositions. Their ratios of gram negative to gram positive and um, some of them are similar depending on, you know, are they formed in the same parent materials? Are they uh, deep soils? Are they clay pan soil? These add to, to variables that make them similar, uh, but you, we have to remember that when we're looking at phospholipid fatty acid data, we're looking at biomasses of structural components in these, in these microbes and not necessarily the function. And that's why we want to get into the amplicon sequencing and the, and the genome sequencing of these soils. So we can actually pull out function. We can pull out uh, some measures of, of diversity at the phylum level. So we can get into things like proteobacteria, alpha, beta, um, gamma, proteobacteria, and acidobacteria, and, and verruca microbia, and all sorts of different things that are sitting in the prairies and other soils to see if they are 
comparable to see if those the ratios of those uh, species or phylum are um, are similar. So we we can't say definitively from from some of this microbial data, but um, it's you know we're we're trying to do that. And I'm I'm failing to remember the second question. Oh, between ecosystems, between yes. two different ecosystems, prairie soils um, are are typically different. Uh, they're some of the most diverse. The prairie soil is likely the most biodiverse ecosystem on the planet it, it, in all grasslands across the world, not just in Missouri, but um, they rival the tropics in biodiversity as far as their soils go and, and, and things like that. When you get into, uh, once again, these are all connected. So when you look at chemical interactions in the soil, such as carbon and nitrogen, and at depth and the amount of carbon that can be put into those soils, the types of carbon that can be put into those soils um, leads to the diversity of microbial communities. And when you look at forested systems, they're, they're by no means simplified. These are very complex systems, but they don't tend to hold the biodiversity above ground that a prairie does. So when you think of that superficial biodiversity, imagine the chemical interactions below ground and how diverse those are going to be, leading to a, a vast array of different um, microorganisms. But they're, they're, they're not simple by any means, they're just, they are different and they don't look the same, they don't act the same. And it, it, it's mostly because of this, those chemical substrates are different between those two systems. Thank you. A um, couple questions from Greg. He says, I have several uh, prairie plantings and I burn a couple of them annually. And I also don't, there's a couple that I don't burn. I see no difference in what is above the soil, but now I'm concerned that I may be damaging soil by burning. Uh, my plantings are predominantly big blue stem and Indian grass. Can you talk about burning and soils? Yeah, so um, also some work was also being done by uh, the Dr. Kristen Viem on, on this subject um, as well, and, uh, and Dr. Bob Kramer, who's also given a webinar here. Uh, the, starting off with the prairie plants, as long as you are not burning extremely, extremely hot and you're keeping yourself within the proper time frame of burning and things like that, Prairie plants have an evolutionary morphology to keep their meristematic tissue below the so prairie soil, right? They are guarded against the intense heat of, of um, fire. Now the soil, the prairie soil is also slightly buffered against that intensity as well. You can always take that out of bounds. You can always exceed that capacity to buffer a prairie soil um, and you can affect those systems. But because the fuels are often so light and the fire moves very quickly in most cases um, across those systems, you don't tend to see a difference on a small time scale. Over long periods of time, you can start um, you can start adding pyrogenic carbon back to the soil, which is not microbially mediated carbon. It is uh, effectively acts as biochar in some systems, but uh, as long as you are staying within a, a pretty conservative um, prescribed fire prescription, uh, I, I would say you're probably okay. And in a lot of cases, these prairies were born in some sort of fire history. Now, the intensity and the duration of those fires it may be a different story, but they were somewhat born in, in fire. Thank you. And then Greg had a, a similar question. Um, what about when looking at row crops versus prairies, what about the effects of insecticides and herbicides in an agricultural system on prairie soils and soil microbiota? So that's a very good question and something I'm deeply interested in as well. Um, one of the things that we overlook often in, in applying herbicides, fungicides, and, and pesticides in general is what are they actually attacking? We typically only think of the plants when we're talking about this. But if we take glyphosate, for example, glyphosate attacks the shikimic acid pathway. And that is shared by all microbial life and plants. It is not in humans or animals in general. It's not in animal cells. 
but it attacks that shikimic acid pathway. So when you put those um, primary metabolites and secondary metabolites into the soil and they're leaching into the soil, you are effectively um, neutralizing the microbial community as well to where a lot of times we see, and you can see this in the literature, I did not directly do this research, but you see that we simplify the microbiome. The generalist species of micro of microbia kind of uh, get past that, that herbicide application and the function is reduced in systems like this. So the big thing to remember is, is our herbicide, look at your herbicide label, understand what that herbicide is attacking and what uh, method that it's incorporating into the plants. Because if it is shared in the microbial community, you are going to affect the microbial community as well. And so once again, a big part of the, the difference between the prairie community and the active agricultural site is likely the use of heavy herbicides and pesticides and fungicides. And they are not selective either. We also need to remember that. They, are, they do not select for things. When we have one problem pest of, of, let's say, a fungal root rot or something, you kill all fungal networks, not just one. So. Thank you, Sam. Um, Melanie asks, are there specific species that have been eradicated in agricultural soils? What species remain? And I, I guess she means uh, species of the, you know, these micro these biomarkers, what, what remain under an agricultural regime, regime that would make a prairie reconstruction possible? So if you, if you take a, a soils that had been in row crops, um, there must be something left so that you can reconstruct. I think that I'm, that's a very good question. What could you talk about that, Sam? Yeah, um, I, we don't have the details of what's lost yet is on the spe on the species specific level. We don't know exactly what is lost. Now you can see that those those samples are simplified between the two. Uh, that's one thing we are afraid of. When we see those massive reductions, what species are completely gone from that system because they are interacted, whether it be an herbicide or have been continually ma manipulated by a mechanical operation or anything of, of that sort, we don't know what's lost. And that's that's the scary part. And, and that brings me to another point, all the more reason to preserve these native grasslands is, is that we don't know exactly what we're doing when we affect these. Um, so I, I can't speak to the specifics, but once again, we are simplifying these, these systems and we don't know what's left. And what is left, once again, tends to be uh, a a more resilient general population of microorganisms that when you're rebounding the biomass, as you can see in the graph on the screen, that's why we don't say function is returning is because there's, there's likely a lot of function missing as you reduce these microbial biomarkers. Thank you. Um, and, and along these lines, Debbie asks, well, and she thanks you for your research and for your talk. What is your best guess about the pathways we need to encourage to get to quote remnant prairie status soils? And maybe we can't, but what is, could you talk about those pathways to try to get at least close? Yeah. So um, first of all, that's a, that's a great question. And, and it's a, uh, it's, it should be at the forefront of research, quite honestly, is, is how uh, management can affect these things. Um, it might not be at the moment, but hopefully in the future, I can kind of tackle problems like that. Um, but first of all, the, we also don't have any evidence of getting back to a remnant status, as Carol said. I, I cannot think of a system where we have reached the same evolutionary trajectory or or functional trajectory of a remnant system once it's been degraded. Once again, the reason, another reason to conserve these things. Um, but two, and, and when you mentioned what management practices we can do um, to increase this, we can put native plants back on the landscape. Not, and, and this is gonna, you're my, my kind of 
pure uh, restoration mindset is going to come out here, <laughs> but um, native genetics of those plants, um, you know, they're within a certain mile radius. So seeds come from a certain area within the restoration site. Are they appropriate for the soil that's in there that, that is uh, being restored or the site that's being restored? Keeping a perennial cover on the soil, living roots all year round is a big deal for bringing back microbial biomass, uh, putting carbon back into the soil, putting organic matter in, whether it be stable or active forms back into the soil to feed the microbial communities that are there and allow them to not only adapt to their surroundings, but um, to increase in their biomass and their function and adapt to the functions that are necessary for that system. So perennial, perennialize your, your, your garden or, or whatever planting it may be. Um, promote native plants in that system. And once again, um, the <laughs> native genetics helps a lot. Those, the plants are adapted to that climate regime, to that amount of precipitation, to the to the temperature regime of that site, um, that helps greatly. And there's an increased likelihood that those plants are interacting with microbes of that site as well, that they would get along, if you will, um, to do that. So I, you know, native plants make it a perennial system and manage non-native species because they do actually affect the soil profile in negative ways, negative plant soil feedback to other species of plants. Thank you. And um, we have some other questions kind of along that line, but we might not be able to get into too much detail, but but the upshot is, question is, you know, if, if you have an abandoned area or, or, or an area covered with asphalt, in other words, if you have soil that's really, really bad, mm -hmm. we still shouldn't give up on it, right? I mean, we, even if if a soil, of course, we need to be protecting remnants, obviously, and that's what NPF really focuses on. But I guess it's you know if if soil can be restored, we should try to do that, right? I mean, even if it's never going to be like a remnant prairie soil, we're going to have so many other benefits. We should be planting native plants, just as you said, wherever we can. I mean, would you agree with that? I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And, and there are other benefits than just seeing the metrics you see on the screen for my webinar. Um, increased water holding capacity, yes. re reduction in runoff, not relying on sewer systems to divert water into places where it did not originate is a big deal. Um, uh, increasing organic matter back into that substrate is going to increase the physical properties of the soil. Uh, not only that, but the chemical properties, and then once again, the biological properties of that soil, even if it is heavily degraded, uh, no matter what state it is in, um, we should be trying to uh, keep a perennial cover of native plants indicative of the area um, back in those profiles, and it, it would have so many benefits. The problem is we tend to think on human time scales, and we don't like things that don't happen very quickly, right? And, and so we need to get better about being patient and seeing results and, um, and, and maintaining long-term restorations and, and not putting five years into it and then walking away from a money issue or, or a manpower issue, that kind of thing. So it, I completely agree, Carol, that we should take any effort to restore a natural community back to what it was and not just Prairie, whatever that community yes. was. Mm -hmm should should likely be put back onto that onto that site. Yes. Thank you. Um, here's a, a question that um, I, I think you you address, but I think it would be um, great if you could just talk about this again because it is such a, a mysterious, amazing thing. Where does carbon go when it leaves the soil? It goes to the atmosphere. In, in short, in short, it is the the soil is constantly breathing, right? It is literally breathing just like we do. It takes in oxygen, it respires CO2. Now, that is a cycle that has been happening for millions and millions and millions of years. The difference is, in our native systems, we are incorporating carbon into the soil as a storage mechanism. And it is storing, but also respiring at the same time, storing and then respiring. But 
the storage can go on for thousands of years in the right system. That carbon can be around for thousands of years, um, at least how we understand carbon right now. Some people do fight how carbon is stored. But um, essentially, when we broke up the prairie sod and, and you know, nothing against John Deere, but he made the steel plow. And when he made that implement to be able to fight through the thick prairie soil and, and the roots there, that was likely one of the most acute destructions of the soil profile in history. Right? So uh, that, that initial flush of carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere um, has been occurring throughout history since that time. And, and in short, it, that CO2 goes back to the atmosphere and it adds to our already um, problematic um, increase in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So. Thank you. I, I love that he, hearing you say that the soil is literally breathing. That's wonderful. I love thinking about that. Um, oh boy, we, we have some more questions, but you know, we, we had 202 people on and we still have 118 people on. So I think they would really love to hear answers to these other questions. Um, so if you have time, we have a few more here. Um, I do. I'd be happy to. And there's a couple questions here. I might I might answer quickly, but I would love for you to add to it. There's a couple questions about when are the most important aspects of pr protecting remnants and how to how can landowners um, identify remnants. And I would say, you know, the Missouri Prairie Foundation, the core of our work is to identify and and protect or original remnant prairies. And we, we do that by acquiring land from willing landowners. Uh, and that's why we, we raise money to, to buy land and to steward that land. Um, sometimes prairies are donated to us. Another way to protect remnants is to help land private landowners who do own prairies. And yes, there are agencies um, that private landowners can work with, the Missouri Department of Conservation. Um, if you have a remnant prairie, if you're an owner of a prairie, we also, the Missouri Prairie Foundation now has a private prairie landowner support program to help get tools to private landowners who own um, original prairies. There are cost share programs for if you have land that's been disturbed, but there's not as many um, cost share programs for land that's not been disturbed that, but that we want to protect. And so we can include some information about that in the email that goes out, as well as a link to contact private land conservationists with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Um, and there, the Conservation Department, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, and the Soil and Water Conservation Districts also have cost share programs to help reconstruct and plant natives. And there was another question, are there agencies working with, for example, cattle producers to plant natives? And yes, absolutely there are. So um, did you wanna add anything to that, Sam, to, to those? Yeah, real quickly, um, if, if you think you may know somebody with a, a, a remnant site or a slightly undisturbed site or not, just something that hasn't been disturbed in an extremely long period of time. Um, first of all, don't touch it. <laughs> Number two, call somebody, collaborate with somebody, as Carol said, to um, somebody who can go out there and assess that situation. Uh, oftentimes, um, I, you know, when I first started out, I was guilty of this and I'll fully admit it. You can take a wildflower book out somewhere that is uh, full of species and to the untrained eye, you'd be like, that is that. And it's just a noxious weed. This happens a lot in our thistles um, it, where they're not actually the non-native um, invasive thistle, uh, but people kill it off anyway. Um, that can that can happen. So I, I would I would ask people to, to try to be collaborative in understanding those sites. And before you do anything, um, ask and, and, you know, we can always work something out and I'd be happy to be part of the process too. Thank you. Yes. And I echo that. Do contact the Prairie Foundation. If you think you have an original remnant, um, we will help you at however possibly ways that however we can, we will try, we will help you. Um, we have just see, there's four more questions and I think we're going to have to wrap up with these. Um, Kathleen asks, does your glyphosate data re relate only to foliar spraying 
with perhaps some collateral damage or also to selective stem treatments? So uh, first of all, I just want to say I don't have the glyphosate. Um, that is not my data. I'm not going to claim it. Uh, but there is extensive research on this subject. And, and once again, um, when you're talking about a foliar spray, if, if you are spot spraying things in a very light, um, a light concentration and, and you're doing it with the best of intentions to only touch the plant, it's important to remember that that's incorporated into the plant and also goes through root exudates as well. So even in the best intentions, we are affecting some things, um, even if we're not meaning to. But uh, in a lot of this literature, I can't speak to the mechanism of which it's applied. One thing I can say is that over applications of herbicides are rampant throughout any system you go into. And um, it, once again, they're often with the best intentions, even in restoration practices. But we need to remember that these prairies are in symbiosis. There is not one species of plant in a prairie or any ecosystem in the world that does not depend on another organism. And when you affect one of those organisms, you are affecting two and then down the line, right? So it's just, it's being um, methodical in how you do things, being aware of the effect of those, of those um, applications. Thank you, Sam. And, and I, I would like to just add one thing to that. And I absolutely agree on very judicious, careful use of herbicides. We should all be concerned with any kind of chemical use. However, I will say that if we want to protect uh, native plant diversity and, and insect diversity that depend on those plants, the Prairie Foundation does use very targeted, limited use of herbicides. And if we did not, we would lose native plant diversity. Um, we are very careful, uh, uh, though, and, and it's a very important tool. Um, and I'd also say that judicious use of herbicide is the a very good way to prevent using more herbicide in the future. So we scout our prairies as many as three times in a growing season to spot spray. And with these intact prairies, um, it, it, while they're not immune to invasive plants, they tend to be somewhat more resilient just because there's so many native plants packed in there. There's less chance, there's less opportunity for invasives to, to, to get a foothold. So I just wanted to add that. Um, and I would also like to add that I also use herbicides. So it, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, don't use them. I, I just want people to be aware of what they're absolutely. doing when they do it. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not a perfect world. We're really in a race against time to protect exactly. as many of these remnants and the soils and the plants. And, and so we have to use these different tools. Um, Carolyn has a question. Is there a prairie that's being restored, or maybe she means reconstructed, that has been very surprising as far as the results and the way the soil has at least somewhat recovered? I'm trying to think of, um, you know, each, each of these reconstructions, each of these restorations have different histories behind them. Um, some have been degraded very heavily and some of them have not been degraded that much. And a lot of times that's the biggest difference in how they recover are, are is that land use history? What, what are the treatments that were put there? How were they managed? Um, those lightly managed systems, and often these are uh, systems that were converted to uh, pasture and grazing, that aren't as intensive on the soil profile. They are, but they are not as intensive. They tend to rebound a little bit quicker on those metrics that I've mentioned. Um, but when you get into the nitty gritty of a lot of these, um, you start finding out that large inputs of fertilizer have affected the ability of some of these rebounding systems as well. There's a legacy effect of things like phosphorus and, and potassium and um, removal of micronutrients across the, the system as well that some of these conservative plants really rely on. So um, in, in short, I don't know if they're surprising so much, and that may be because I, I'm privy to the soil data behind them, <laughs> but um, it, there are some that when you look at them, you would expect to see lower indicators, and sometimes you don't. 
and often it's because of the resilience of the soil itself too. So uh, surprised, maybe not, but when you look at it, it's like, that doesn't fit what I thought was going to happen, right? Thank you, Sam. Um, this is topic is a little a little bit not related to your talk, but it's a it is a really good question. Pam asks, why are native plant nurseries saying not to combine peat with the soil when planting natives? Is that because of the carbon loss, or could you talk about? I mean, peat is what is peat exactly? Well, when they're talking about peat, it's normally mined peat moss from somewhere in the northern uh, latitudes. Um, I honestly cannot speak to why they would do that. I I, I don't know enough about, um, you know, you can ask my wife, I'm a terrible gardener. <laughs> I'm very bad at it. Uh, you know, I, I don't even understand how potting soil is. I mean, I understand potting soil, but, you know, the mechanism of, of you know, what a better potting soil is for plant growth in a greenhouse or just in sunlight, it that's tough for me. So I'm just going to be honest and say, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the uh, answer to it in terms of plant growth, but I think that they may be cautioning against it just to reduce the demand for it because it is so, it releases so much greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. I know that, I mean, that's definitely a reason to not use peat. Um, and with the last question from Jeannie, which is a great question to end with, what is a good reference book or website or articles to learn more about soil? That is a great question. And I, um, you know, it's tough to promote a few, um, but one that is used across um, any institution that it is often referenced is um, on the nature and property of soils by Brady and Weil that is used in ev pretty much every introductory soils class. And I think it's on its 15th or 16th edition. So it's been modified over time. And uh, it, you know, if you're wanting to get into soils, it is a great textbook to have on the shelf. And I have one sitting open right next to me right now, actually, um, because I do teach introductory soils. So sometimes I need a reference as well. Uh, the other way to look at it if you get into um, you know, peer-reviewed papers, they can be heavy in the vernacular and the verbiage of them. So uh, I, I may avoid those right off the bat, but um, there are also a lot of online soils classes that you can take for free that you can find on YouTube. And I would recommend looking at those if you're really interested. But if you're more of a textbook person, um, The Nature and Property of Soils by Brady and Weil is a, is a good one. Thank you. I just put that into the chat. And um, in the email that goes out tomorrow, we will, of course, Sam's <laughs> webinar recording will be a great reference. And we have some other webinar recordings from some of um, Sam's, uh, he mentioned Dr. Kristen Bume, which is one of his advisors, and some of his other colleagues have done webinars for us. We'll include links to those as well. Um, and also some articles about um, various aspects of prairie soil. So we'll include those tomorrow. Um, Sam, thank you so very much. Um, we still have 86 people on, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll end here. But also um, we have another webinar coming up on April 26th on how to spring into action right now to help, all, help birds. Um, so another aspect of the natural world um, and we invite everyone to participate in our Prairie Bio Blitz, which will be at Carver Prairie on June 3rd and 4th, and we'll have registration open for that soon. We have prairie hikes coming up um, that you can go on um, if you're able to travel, and uh, we have many resources online if you're not a able to travel. As always, let us know if you have questions about our work, and you can learn more at moprairie.org and also at gronative.org. Sam, thank you so much. I know you have a very um, busy schedule, so we greatly appreciate you sharing your expertise and time with us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Enjoy this lovely spring. Bye-bye.